we're going to go ahead and put him on. There we go. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and begin. We want to welcome each of you to Fair Bluff Baptist Church today. It's such a joy to see each and every one of you. We have our uh, chairs uh, out on the lawn, and we have our cars over on the side of the CLC, and it is just precious that we are able to be out here today to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is our prayer today that during this worship service, you would be able to sense the love of the Father, the peace of Jesus the Son, and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit as we come together as a body of believers today. This past week, um, our nation has been filled with civil unrest, with peaceful protest, and with looting and rioting that has caused damage uh, physically and economically. And so this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to pray a prayer of peace. But I want to begin that prayer with the words of Francis of Assisi, St. Francis of Assisi, who wrote these words that have been put to music in a song called Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Would you listen to his words and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. He wrote, Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there is doubt, true faith in you. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there is sadness, ever joy. O oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Would you go to the Lord with me in prayer, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, as we stop during the crazy of this past week and all that we have experienced dear Lord we come before you and we acknowledge that we are a broken people our nation is broken our state is broken our county our town our church and we as individuals, dear Lord, are broken, and we're broken because of sin. And Father, we know that you are the only one who can heal every part of this world. Because you are our healer, and you are our peace. So Father, as we join our hearts together this morning, we pray, dear Lord, that you would show us how we can be instruments of your peace and how we can share your love to a world that so desperately needs to experience that love. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We ask your Lord that all that we do this morning would bring honor and glory to you alone. And we pray this. Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn to the back of your bulletins as we sing our call to worship the bond of love?
So would you uh, welcome now Adam as he comes to share just a few words about the power of prayer and how much uh, our law enforcement needs our churches and um, all believers. Come on up, Adam, to support them. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I hope everybody's doing well. Either you're here on Facebook. Um, I just want to come this morning and tell you that we truly do appreciate your thoughts and your prayers. Um, these are very difficult times that we're going through with law enforcement and the medical profession. Um, the media tries to point you in the direction that everybody has turned their backs on us as um, law enforcement, but we do understand that there are still God-fearing people out there that believe in the same thing that, we, that, that, that we're trying to stand for. Um, I can't fix it. Law enforcement can't fix this issue. The only person that can fix this issue is God. He has to change these people's hearts. Um, they're, like I said, they're hurting. They might not hurt for reasons that people believe they hurt, but they're, they're hurting for God. That's the, that's the main thing. Um, if you would, please continue to pray for us. Um, that's, that's, I know you're not on the streets with us. You're not in my car, but you don't know how much it means to me to have y'all out there praying for me that's really just putting a hedge of protection around me and my co-workers. Um, I know, I know the Highway Patrol really appreciates it, local law enforcement, and our, and our nation. That's just what we need, it's just prayer. Um, I just want to thank you this morning for that. Have a, have a good day. Thank you, Adam. If you'll stand right here. I've asked, um, I've asked Mr. Randy Coleman, if Ms. Randy, would you come? And Elizabeth, if you and Sherman would come. Randy, if you'll stand right here so that you can speak into the mic. And then Elizabeth, if you will stand. Elizabeth is going to represent our medical personnel. And Sherman, if you'll stand beside Mr. Randy so that you can pray into the mic. We want these two uh, precious uh, individuals. Come on up, uh, Elizabeth. And stand right Sherman, come on back up. Hey. We want you to take a look at these two precious faces because they represent all of those who are taking care of us through law enforcement and through med medical uh, professions. And when we pray, we need to pray remembering that there's a face behind every name. So Mr. Randy, would you pray now for Adam and for law enforcement in Germany? Yes, if, let us pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for all our law enforcement. For Adam and just uh, Tracy, Quentin, just, just uh, uh, I like to say our, our police departments and just all our law, our law enforcement just take care of and have them do the have them to do their job and be able to do their job in your precious name I pray amen dear heavenly father we thank you so much for our medical workers we thank you for allowing them to stand in the gap for us when we are sick and we are in need, and especially during this time of so much uncertainty. Thank you for giving them um, the, the will and the know-how to take care of us and the courage above all. We ask you to protect them and watch over them. These things we ask in your name, Lord. Amen. Thank you all so much. And now as we have our and now as we have our uh, hymn of uh, worship this morning, I've asked, uh, I have it listed in the bulletin as the Axelberg Family Singers. I wanted to introduce them as the Von Trapp Family Singers because everybody in the Axelberg family except Jeff knows how to sing. Sorry, Jeff, but you can do so many other things. <laughs> so now, would you let um, this song, Let There Be Peace on Earth, be our hymn of commitment, our hymn of dedication, not just today, but every day, as we welcome Sherman and Elizabeth Axelberg, uh, future. And before we get started, I just wanted to say, um, Ms. Phyllis and I were talking, and I said, we're just talking about the state of our world right now, with um, everything going on um, racially, and um, I told her, you know, I've lived in Fairbrook my entire life except for when I was in college and when we moved to Raleigh. 
And whenever I was in college, um, I went there, this little southern girl from Fair Bluff, and I had several roommates, two of which were African American. And I'm not gonna lie, I was freaked out. And by going off to school and living with two people that were so different from me, um, seemingly, I realized that they weren't different. They were just like me. And it changed my whole way of looking at things. I came back home and when we moved to Raleigh, it was again a time of growth because it's very different in Raleigh. And I, Jeff and I both grew um, from that experience. And we were so thankful that our children were able to grow from that experience. And, you know, we just want people to understand that just because you grew up in it doesn't mean that's where you to stay. Um, our boys have friends and our girls have friends that are every color and they are just as precious to us as anybody else. Um, Elizabeth and Mary Catherine's best friend, Natalie, a precious soul, one of the best people that I know. And I just feel like that if people would embrace everybody, um, our world would be a better place. And if you're not embracing everybody, you are truly missing out. You're missing out on a whole different um, side of the world who just they just want to be loved just like we do um so just just know that just because that's where you came from that doesn't mean that's where you have to stay we just want everybody to be peaceful to me because I believe it's the heart of who we are as Christians and that's why the title of the message this morning is let it begin with me y'all know those of you who know me know that I speak from where I'm living if I'm leading a conference whatever's been taking place in my life that week I, I try to speak to where I'm walking in that moment. And I just believe that as a church, we cannot ignore what's been taking place around our nation this past week with the death of George Floyd, with the 
peaceful protests that have been taking place with the Black Lives Matter movement and even with the rioting and looting that has been unlawful that our law enforcement have had to deal with. And I'm just going to speak to you from my heart this morning. It may be the last Sunday I'm here, but it is what it is. I believe every one of us this morning are in one of three camps. And I want you to just, for a moment, try to discern which camp you're in, okay? The first camp are those people who have experienced systemic racism and discrimination and their pain is real. The second camp are the people who see the problem and they want to help, but they're just not quite sure what they're supposed to do. And the third camp are those people that don't really understand what all the fuss is about and they just wish that like the COVID-19 that it would just simply go away. Well, I want you to know that your camp that you're in right now is determined by three things. It's determined by your own personal experience. It's determined by your knowledge of the situation because there's always more than one side to a story. And it's determined by your worldview. And your worldview many times is developed in how you grew up. So I want to share for just a moment a little bit about my background to let you know where I'm coming from. I grew up in the Green Sea community, Norton in particular, Woody. Go Norton. But my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, owned and operated a country store where the bathrooms were labeled whites only and the water fountains were whites only or blacks. Charles's dad, Dr. Randy Elmington, had a doctor's office in Nichols and there were two separate waiting rooms, one for whites, one for blacks. We used to go to, to the Ritz Theater in Tabor City to watch movies when Elvis, those were, that was in his heyday. We even saw, I remember my whole family went to see The Sound of Music. The balcony was reserved for blacks. White people sat down in the main theater. I was in the sixth grade when integration started, but I was in the ninth grade before I had my first black teacher. That was the way I was raised. But as Sherman said, that doesn't make it right. I personally want to do better and I want to be better. And I want us as a church to, to take this and look at it that if we're not a part of the solution, we're a part of the problem. Now, I, I've never experienced discrimination because of the color of my skin. But I want you to know that I have experienced discrimination because I am a woman. Now, if you are a white male sitting out here today, it's going to be hard for you to understand what a black man's going through. It's also going to be hard for you to understand what a woman is going through. I want you to know that several years ago, I was speaking at a church outside of Charlotte that will remain nameless. They invited me to speak for Focus on WMU. But because they didn't want a woman in the pulpit during the morning worship hour, they switched it and they said, we're going to have worship at 10 o'clock and we're going to have Sunday school at 11. So I wouldn't be standing in the pulpit at 11 o'clock. And you know what I said? It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Right now, if I were a black woman in a black church, there'd be no problem with being the pastor. If I was a white woman in a Methodist church, there wouldn't be a problem with me being a pastor. Thank the Lord, Fair Bluff Baptist Church has seen that we can't limit what God can do. I just want you to know you need to figure out what camp you're in so that we can be part of the solution and not part of the problem. 
If you'll turn in your Bibles or either turn to the back of your bulletin to Micah chapter 6. I want to read today. And we may be here longer than 30 minutes, but we haven't had full church in three months. So just settle in, okay? Because I got a word to say and I want to say it. Can you just say hallelujah? That was kind of weak, but here we go. Micah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? Have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron, Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Baor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgah, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. And our focus verses for today, picking up with verse 6, state, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Peter Craigie in the Daily Study Bible tried to explain this passage of Scripture this way. Follow with me if you would. The scene in Micah chapter 6 is a courtroom setting. God is the judge. Micah is his counsel. The witnesses are the mountains and the hills and the foundations of the earth. And the charge that is implied is that Israel has grown tired of God and they've chosen to go their own way. And God asks, why? Have I let you down? Have I not met your every need? And the defendant, Israel in this case, doesn't deny the charge. They know they're guilty. And so they ask this question. They say, what must I do to set things right? They were thinking about ritual activity. They said, Lord, if we bring you burnt offerings, would, would that fix it? And then they said, if, you, if we bring you lots of burnt offerings, would that fix it? Then they said, well, what about if we even sacrifice our children? Would that make it right? And just by asking those questions, they showed their lack of faith in Almighty God. Because our religion is not one of externals, but it's one of internals. J. Vernon McGee said, external religion without internal experience is absolutely valueless. God never begins with what you do. He always begins with who you are. We can't, we can't, and we are not saved by works because all of our works are as filthy rags before the Lord. Micah 6, 8 says there's three things that God requires for us to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Well, we don't have time today for me to cover all three, but I'm going to focus on the last part because I'm going to tell you plain and simple. You are not going to do justly or love mercy if you are not walking humbly with your God. So I want us to look at that last phrase. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the preacher's preacher, wrote in 1818 that to do right 
is better than to perform the most inspiring religious acts. And he went on to say that when a man's heart is right with God, a man's heart is going to be right toward his fellow man. What does it mean to walk humbly with your God? It begins with recognizing that God is a sovereign being, that he is real, that he's true, that he is ever present. God is not a myth or an idea or some vague concept. To say that we are to walk only with God is to recognize that he's a God who sees us and knows us and hears us and cares about us, who hears our cry. But he's not just a God. He's our God. He said, what is good to walk humbly with your God? He's your creator. He's your sustainer. He's your healer. He's your comforter. The third thing in walking humbly with our God is to walk. And if you don't remember anything else from the message this morning, I want you to remember this this part of the, of the message. To walk with God denotes an active habit. Now, sometimes we say that we, we bow in prayer or we sit in our study as we study or meditate on God's Word. But walking describes a common pace. You don't have to be in really good shape to just walk. But when we're talking about walking with God, we're not just talking about walking on Sunday. We're talking about walking with God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. When you're at work, when you're in the kitchen, when you're on the ball field, when you're watching TV, when you're surfing Facebook, when you're cutting the grass, but it's not just any kind of walking. It says what is good and pleasing, Charles. Charles loves to walk. It says it's to walk humbly with thy God. And that qualifier there tells us how we're to walk with him. We walk reverently with a spirit that understands that we are ashes and dust. And God is almighty, eternal God. We remember that we worship him when we're in his presence. That we are overwhelmed by his presence, that we depend on him to meet our needs, and that we yield to his leading. Have you ever noticed when you're walking with someone, Vicki Lynn, you walk, there are many of you out here, Jeff and Sherman, y'all walk, Dr. Lundy and, and, uh, uh, and Linda, they walk. Have you ever noticed when two people are walking that one person kind of sets the pace and then the other person follows along? Well, I'm gonna tell you something. If you're walking humbly with God, you're going to be following His pace. You're going to look like the Lord when you're walking. He was meek and lowly, not dominating, not domineering your fellow man, not being hard or cruel or unkind. If we walk with God, we won't trample on anybody else. We'll be a good neighbor and a considerate friend, and we'll have a Christ-likeness about us that the world will be able to see. You see, when you spend time walking with somebody, you're gonna start resembling that person. In closing, what does it look like to do justly and to love mercy? Matthew 7, 12 says, so whatever you would that men would do to you, do you likewise to them? For this is the law and the prophets. If we would just treat other people the way we want to be treated, with respect and compassion and love, if we would treat people the way we want them to treat our children, and the way we want them to treat our grandchildren. 
1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote the I Have a Dream speech that he gave on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial at the March on Washington in Washington, D.C. Cameron, you had to memorize this particular thing that I'm reading today because I, Cameron was one of my students and each week they had to, to learn uh, the preamble to the Constitution. They had to learn part of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech. They had to memorize their social security number and they always were so fussing at me on why they had to memorize their social security number. I said, because you're gonna have to use it the rest of your life. This is what Dr. Martin Luther King said. I say to you today, my friends, this was in 1963 when I was in the third grade. We face the difficulties of today and tomorrow. I still have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I believe that God has a dream. I believe that his dream involves us being part of the solution and not part of the problem. That we try to put ourselves in the places that other people are living. That when you pray for law enforcement, that you envision that being your son or your husband getting in that car, that police car. That when you pray for our medical staff, that you think about that being your daughter or your, your wife that's gonna walk into a room full of COVID patients that you're a mother of two black young men, that you're afraid for them to walk from their church to their home. We're gonna to close today by singing what I believe is God's dream. Let others see Jesus in you. Would you turn to the back of your bulletins? Would you pray that God will speak to your heart that as you sing these words, that it will be your prayer that you might be that instrument of peace.
lead us in our prayer of benediction. Yeah. You know, think back to uh, the chip and I were talking about this morning, to a tobacco field, growing up there in Love. We were all in the same field working together, you know, the, to have, have things, to be able to eat, you know, to, to have clothes. Uh, I've never, um, I believe that's one of the best things anybody could ever know if you We had to be put together as a family to, to have something, black, white, it's going to no matter. I've slept in a mini hotel room with many different people, I'll tell you that. And uh, but I was sitting there reminded by the, the golden rule. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, remind us always to put you first. Uh, heart, mind, soul, dear Heavenly Father, let it be you first, dear God. And to love our neighbor the way we love ourselves, dear Heavenly Father. And that would fix everything, dear Lord. Uh, thank you so much for letting us be on these grounds today, dear Heavenly Father. Worship to you. Uh, Thank you so much for all the many blessings you've given to us. And uh, keeping the waters down, dear God, continue to be with us this way to bless us, dear God. I pray and forgive us of our sins for it. It be your will, dear God. Grant us wisdom, courage, and strength always to do your will to master our prayer. Amen.